So not only is that the technological side, but if the central banks continue to print, the price should do particularly well. So, you know, generally speaking, I've switched 100% of my liquid net worth into the digital asset market. The inflation that drives crypto markets more so is the printing of money by central banks. And you can measure that by looking at the amount the central banks print and the effect it has on asset classes. It's actually highly correlated. And crypto does particularly well when the central banks are printing. Because of its limited supply, it has its scarcity value and it tends to rise, but it also rises exponentially because it has this call option on the future element to it as we're building out this new technological world. We'll probably get a bit of a growth scare um, during the first half of 2022, and that should continue, I think, to support the crypto markets. It is the fastest growing adoption of any technology in all recorded human history. Back in 97, the internet was growing at 63% a year with 150 million users. Crypto has about the same number of users and it's growing at 113% a year. So the network adoption of this entire digital asset space continues to grow. And there'll be times where I'll have less of a waiting, but right now it still seems the right waiting to have. You know, I've spoken to a lot of corporations about this, about you know, why do they have stuff on their balance sheet? Why do the treasurers have cash? And when you ask them, it's really for a few things. One is to buy back their shares in the US. The other is to buy real estate uh, and the others to buy other companies. And the problem is, is the debasement of fiat currency means that all of those things go up. Their own share price goes up, their, the cost of real estate goes up and, um, and the other companies they want to acquire go up in value and their cash doesn't because they get 3% return on their cash. So trying to get people to shift and realize that if you want to keep up with the appreciation of assets with your cash, because everybody's income is staying roughly the same, they need to start making this shift. So yes, I totally agree that it's sensible. It just depends how much risk you want to take. I think it's temporary. And the reason being is they're rolling out their central bank digital currency. So why do they want to stop all crypto activity while they're rolling it out? It's pretty straightforward. The central bank digital currency allows them to know where all of the money is in circulation. So what you need to do is bring all of the money back into the system where you can. So then once you reopen to crypto, you know the, mo the money's gone there and you can track it for taxation and other purposes. So I can see that happening. China also is trying to avoid capital flight. A lot of wealthy people have been using crypto uh, for capital flight but that still continues via Singapore so it's still going on but they're trying to slow that down they wanted to get rid of the mining because mining was competing for uses of electricity and driving up electricity prices you know China's big aim is to keep uh, um, to not allow social unrest so what you really need to do is not allow prices to rise as much so not to allow the miners to use the electricity was one of those. So I hold two thoughts in my head. One is the optimistic thought of the metaverse, which is the ability, I mean, look what we're doing now. I'm in the Cayman Islands, you're in Germany. I'm seeing a digital representation of you and it feels very natural and we're used to it. The sound is digitized. I don't know what computer you're on, all of these things work. That's part of the metaverse, the digitization of everything. And that's great because I didn't have to get on a plane to come to see you today. Even that would have been lovely to be there, but look at the ease that this has created. The ability to connect with people in a meaningful way that wasn't available with a, just a phone call. I also think the metaverse offers entirely new opportunities to create revenue, and we're not constrained by the resources that are on planet Earth. The metaverse exists beyond that because it's just digital resources. And the digitization of everything tends to trend the cost of everything down to zero. The metaverse is where the majority of our lives become digital and we create these unique experiences that may be virtual reality, augmented reality, or just 3D or just digital representations. And we're seeing that creeping into our lives every day. But because it happens incrementally, we don't realize it. And, you know, in a couple of years time, we'll have augmented reality maps on our iPhone and we'll be using that and we won't be thinking, oh, this is the metaverse, but it is. When I get in my Tesla, that's essentially the metaverse. It's a car entirely run digitally now. 
Um, and that's an extraordinary thing. And as it goes around, it is recording how I drive, where I go, the state of the roads, everything, and putting that back into the AI that drives that. Once you add augmented reality, you'll be able to drive down a street and it'll tell you who lives there, what's going on, anything, you know, all of these things. So I'm hugely optimistic, but it will get used for nefarious aims too. It's like saying, how far are we away from the internet? It's not a concept because it's an ever evolving thing. How far are we away from AR being a augmented reality being a large part of our lives? I would say three years. So in three years, Apple will have launched a full suite of AI, AR um, maps, and we will start building on AR much like we do on the internet. VR, obviously, we've got incredibly high rendition worlds and you can exercise there, you can meet people, you can set up your own office, all of these things. The problem is, is nobody wants to have a VR headset because it's actually difficult to integrate into the physical world. But that will change too. So if your AR, your VR headset allows you to still see around you, because it's actually really disorientating, but if you can still see the room you're in, well, that's not very far away. So I, I think we're in this exponential age where we think linearly, but what happens is everything moves much faster. So I, I think if we were to sit back here on this stage in five years time and look back at our conversation, we'll be going, wow, I, I think the technology is amazing. This is basically the ability to tokenize everything. So I think we will see tokenized real estate rise. I think we will see all ticketing move to NFTs, we're obviously seeing digital art because that was an easy place to start. So the technology itself, we're only just scratching at the surface of what we can do with a non-fungible token. And it's basically a unique identifier digitally for something. So if I then look and say, okay, if we're digitizing everything and the digital asset space is essentially the digitization of value, that includes the securities markets, how big are they? So equities are about 250 trillion, 300 trillion. Global real estate's 350 trillion. Global bonds about 250 trillion. So if digital assets are truly the disruptive new asset class that basically absorbs all of those over time, is it so much to say that it could be worth 250 trillion? So that's 100x in market cap. So we will have never seen in human history an entire asset class grow in size by 100x in, I think, 10 years. <laughs>